Hi, this is Michael Uslan. You're listening to Batman on Film. I'm vengeance. I have given a name to my pain. Welcome to episode 196 of the Batman on Film podcast. I am BOF senior contributor Ryan Lauer, sitting in for Minnesota's finest, Garrett Grev. Now, BOF is the proud host of the Batman Podcast Network. Just go to batmanonfilm.com, click on the Batman Podcast Network for a whole list of other great Bat-related shows. Now, thank you for listening to this special episode. It's not special because I'm hosting this. It's special because of my guest. Uh, joining me is the creator of the White Knight universe, the Murphyverse, um, the newly released Batman Beyond the White Knight number one. It's Sean Murphy. Sean, welcome to the podcast. Oh, I think you're pretty special too, Ryan. Don't oh, uh, <laughs> short, sell yourself too short there. Well, thank you. That's kind of you to say, but they're here for you. They're not here for me. Uh, <laughs> I just told you, but I want to say it so that everybody can hear it, that I really appreciate your time and you stopping in to, to talk about um, uh, Batman. No. You're doing me a favor, man. I we talked on flying a little bit. Uh, the the rollout for this book got a little messed up, and uh, the marketing was a little confused. So I'm kind of trying to do a few of these just to fix it. Uh, yeah. It's taken me too long, honestly. I know I've been in contact with you or one of the other guys for a few years now, and I normally do the bat bat. Uh, what is it called? The Bat Force Radio guys usually get me first. Uh, I'm not one to do a whole lot of these because I sure. I fear uh, too much white noise out there, but. You know, I'm happy to talk to you now, and I apologize it's taken so long. <laughs> no, no apology necessary. It's okay. You're a you're a busy man now. Before I I gotta ask this because it's Batman on film. Have you seen the Batman yet? I have. Okay. What do you think? Yeah, I liked it. Okay. I, there's a weird. Uh, I have a two minute uh, story about why it was really sure. weird for me. Okay. Uh, I hate to, <laughs> okay. Um, going into it, I started getting a bunch of messages from friends saying that they used a lot of white knight in there and i started getting really worried uh as flattering as that stuff is um it's i don't love not being told about that stuff you know makes sense i'm a i'm a realist i'm a businessman i understand dc owns my stuff they can do whatever they want with it you know toys whatever and i know that hollywood is you know guards its secrets carefully and i know that the caller is obviously maybe inspired by my stuff but if they were to use a bunch of it i would hope somebody would give me a heads up and i wouldn't just Mm -hmm. find out in the movie theater you know um so i was nervous going in because i was afraid they were going to use my stuff and they didn't tell me about it and um i was happy to to see that they didn't really use any of my stuff which made me feel fine (laughs) you know um they used a lot of libra mayho stuff and um you know there's some long halloween in there and um you know we all know what we saw in that um, but yeah, I, I told my friends they were just getting all uh, worked up for no reason. I'd be flattered if, if they did that. And um, I talked to Lee Bermejo and he said that he thinks for the sequel, they might be using some White Knight stuff in there. So we'll see. Yeah. But uh, as of now, I have no idea. Um, so yeah, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was the best looking Batman movie ever. Um, I think I still prefer um, the Heath Ledger one as far as plot goes. Same. But uh yeah, I wish Same. I could mix this this movie and that, and in, in there is the perfect Batman film. I think. Sure, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I could I could imagine that it was maybe a not a bad experience, but you had something on your mind going in if, with everybody building up that they borrowed a lot of White Knight, so you're kind of viewing it differently than just as as an average fan, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. As as a fan, I was loving it. As a professional who has a stake in Batman, I was worried sure. that if they, if I saw my stuff on the screen, I, I would have to make a bunch of phone calls the next day, and figure out what happened, and get angry, yeah. and blah blah. blah. <laughs> and I don't I don't want to be that guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, let's talk about your uh, your professional career then. And sure. Uh, sure, the White Knight universe or the Murphyverse. Which one do you like to call it? I don't care. It's don't uh, care. I I didn't I didn't name it Murphyverse. That's just what DC started calling it. So uh, I ca- you can call it whatever you want. Honestly. <laughs> okay. 
Perfect. Well, we're talking now, by the time that this airs, uh, Batman Beyond the White Knight, number one, is out. It's available. Uh, buy it. Your comic shop, buy it digitally, all that. How does it feel for this new chapter to be out now? Oh, I'm, uh, man, I'm four issues in. I've been really pouring my heart into this for, you know, the past six months. So it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's interesting to see pages that I did months and months and months ago finally get uh, appreciated and read by, by readers and customers, you know. Um, it's always a load off to see. It's such an intensive process to write and draw your own Batman book. Um, and it's such a, it takes a lot of patience because it takes a long time to do the art and then getting it colored and then lettered and all that. And there's so much effort into one silly little comic book. Uh, like I love it. Don't get me wrong, but mm-hmm. it is nice when it finally hits and you can see people, the reviews are generally positive or they get excited about the things they're excited about. Or, you know, this one had a few big um, surprises in it uh, as well. Issue two, especially the ending of issue two. So I'm oh. really dying to see what people think about it. The first tease right there. There you go. The yeah. end of issue Did you two. Read the, okay. So you read the first issue. I've read the first issue. I okay. loved it. The review now, uh, while yeah. we're recording this, it's been submitted to Bill. Bill will post it uh, okay. release day morning. So yeah, it, it got an A cool. from me. Thank you. I, I should yes. send you uh, the PDF for issues two and three so you could get all caught up. I would gladly accept and read it. Let me just, yeah, I'll, I'll pleasure, tell you man. that. And, and if you <laughs> didn't agree to talk on here, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate that, and I think I told you this, that I've been in on White Knight since, uh, I mean, you could say the ground floor since issue one, picked it up, bought it, read it. And I've got bills. Let me review it all the way, like every issue, including the Harley Quinn series and stuff. And I am yeah. all in on the Murphy verse. We'll oh, call it the Murphy you. versus. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm, I'm all yeah. in. So um, <laughs> yeah. And I really, I'm really excited what you're going to do with this because a fan so far and it's not that I don't like Batman beyond it's just not necessarily I'm in the Batman mood. I'll grab Batman beyond to watch it. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's interesting to me of like, Oh, you're incorporating Batman beyond into this series. What are you going to do? How are you going to Sean Murphy it? You know what I mean? <laughs> Question. Uh, so I, for me, the animated series, the first one is where the, my heart is at. Mm-hmm. I, I know the animated series it's like the back of my hand beyond I'm less familiar with, but I've, I've seen all the episodes at least twice. Um, and as this was coming out, I was getting ready to go to college. So I wasn't seeing all the episodes. I just didn't have the time to really absorb it all. Like I did the, the you know animated series. So it kind of flew a little under my radar. I remember in college seeing the, the return of the Joker movie, which I thought mm-hmm. was, was really epic. Um, and I had always once I realized I was going to do a sequel to volume one, I decided that for the third one, I should probably just get into Batman Beyond. I, uh, I knew that the Beyond series the comics was kind of going on for a while and might end and there would be a market for like, you know, a new Batman Beyond. Um, I knew that my readers who were like at the perfect age for that thing, they would be old enough to have kids now too. And they would be up for, it, it just seemed like the appropriate topic to, to cover and like the natural way to evolve the plot, you know? Um, but to make it my own, you know, Bruce in my book, he's been in jail for, he's older, but he's not like an old man. He's still got a six pack and he's capable and he's been <laughs> kicking a whole bunch of ass in, in prison. So he's like, you know, I'd say early sixties, um, and uh, Terry is not working for Bruce right now. He's working for uh, Derek Powers, which is a spoiler, but that's that's been in the preview, so that's not no that's no big deal. Um, yeah, I also wanted to set up the idea of the police department having kind of a civil war. Uh, I generally kind of stay away from politics in my 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 books, uh, and this book isn't really that political. But I wanted to do a story where like you have this overpowered GTO program. You have these like gotham super cops um batman gave all of his stuff away to help the police department and while that seems like a nice idea it doesn't seem like it completely worked and he's realizing that he needs to escape to stop batman because terry stole a bat suit from the the bat cave and he wants to shut down the the police the gto um but i'm not saying all cops are bad i i have friends that are cops i think there's good cops and bad cops obviously so i wanted to show a bunch of good cops too so we have barbara gordon who's commissioner and um she's you know in charge of just the regular blue collar you know hardworking police and uh, there's a giant class divide um 
kind of in the background of the entire story. And by the end of it, I, I'm setting it up to have like a big, um, you know, confrontation between the two of them. And caught in the middle is uh, Dick, who's in charge of the GTO, who is gone off to like, he's, he's not a bad guy. He is the antagonist in a lot of ways because he's angry at Bruce, but he's sort of confused. So one of the things that Bruce is going to have to do by the end is talk some sense into Dick, basically. Um, that's the one warning I'll give everybody. If you're a giant Nightwing fan, um, you might not love that Dick is kind of a bad guy for some of the story. Sure. But hang in there. It's obviously he's going to be a good guy by the end of it. Duh. So <laughs> don't don't get too mad. Just stay stick with it. And I think you'll be happy. Wow. That's quite a setup. So, OK, well, then let's go ahead and rewind. So something I, re- I really appreciate when uh, following you, whether I know you used to be on Twitter and Instagram. Now you're on Instagram mostly, but you're very transparent with the. Uh, with your fans. And I think yeah. a long time ago, maybe during the release of white Knight, maybe it was right after, but you kind of set out a plan and you'd said, and maybe it was when you talked to bat force radio and you'd said about a sequel series and then maybe take a, a break to have like a spinoff series and then come back and do a third part. And it kind of seems like it's rare these days that this is, you know, three, four years ago. And it's actually happened just like you oh, said. Oh yeah. Thanks. That's well, it's uh, funny. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's funny because I actually ex- wanted to expand it even more, but COVID hit yeah. and uh, we had a Batgirl White Knight that was approved, but then COVID hit and the artist wasn't able to do it. Um, so that went on the back burner. Um, I thought there would be more spinoffs from my wife's book. She wrote uh, White Knight Presents Harley Quinn. Like mm-hmm. I wanted a Harley and Ivy, so it would be Harley uh... and Neo Joker and Ivy. So... That was a plan that was approved, but then that didn't quite. Uh, we had problems getting that out too. So I, I plan to use my wife's book. Just had bad luck, honestly. So the only things I've been able to get out are mine, and then every now and then one other thing. I, I pitched an entire um, uh, extended universe that would get into like Superman and JLA and um, all kinds of stuff, basically, and I would basically be a showrunner. And I would get other teams to like take my crazy pitches and just, you guys f- figure this out. Give me a writer, yeah. give me an artist. Here's my pitch. Give me a fee or whatever. I put my name on it. And then that's the book. I think if we had one white knight book out uh, every month, whether it was mine or my wife's or a whole other team, uh, that would be a good boon to DC because generally my stuff makes it into the top 10. Um, but I've been having trouble getting that plan approved because things have just been so crazy yeah. in general for the industry, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate the compliment. I did have more plan, but I, I did get uh, swatted back uh, because of uh, unforeseen events, you know? Yeah. But, uh, I, mean, I guess never say never, right? And <laughs> we'll the see. idea of that Poison Ivy, Neo Joker, like, ooh, I, I've never, I don't know if you've ever shared that before or not, but I've never heard that. So that's uh, uh, what, what might have been, what not. maybe still could be. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like a Harley Ivy story, but in my book, Neo jo- the other Harley Quinn became Neo Joker, and mm-hmm. I didn't really do much with her. She was kind of the stand-in villain, but we didn't really get a deep dive in her at all, and I wanted gotcha. to get back to her to really um, fill in the holes of her character in a Harley Ivy book, but as it stands, it's, yeah, she's kind of been forgotten about since volume one, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to bring her back, and maybe one day I can, but uh, yeah, we'll have to see what happens for the rest of the year. Yeah. So, well, when did, uh, I guess, when did it spawn in your head laying out that, that plan of you kind of, cause it seems like you kind of knew where you wanted to go with this. So when did that start to all click together in your head of, I know what I want to do with this. So I, uh, I DC didn't really know this was going to be a hit. Mm -hmm. I, and that's okay. Uh, I'm not throwing any shade. I didn't know it was going to be a hit. I I liked the idea and I hoped it would be a hit. And then I, but once Issue two came out, sorry, issue one came out of the first volume and it was like 80,000, which is huge. Uh, issue two came out and it did about the same numbers. And then issue one started going into second, third and fourth printings. Uh, but that all could have still been um, a, a, a lark or whatever. I don't know. As a writer, I'm not very good with words. <laughs> um, but when issue three went up in numbers, that's when I knew that things had changed. I figured, okay, they're going to ask me to do a sequel. Uh, you know, I had planned to do other books with Batman, uh, with Scott Snyder and some other people. But from now on, it seems like I could just write my own stuff forever. 
So I said, well, I think I just, I'm going to retire from working with other writers. I'm just going to do my own stuff. And I'm not saying, and I'm the best writer ever. I think I can draw a, write a pretty okay script with decent ideas and I can draw it into like an A minus. It's kind of my, kind of my goal, you know? Um, so yeah, once issue three came out and I started talking to DC about doing a sequel, that's when I'm like, okay, so for volume two, maybe we'll do some Azrael. That's a character that no one's really done for a while. I, Azrael was in space at the time. So, okay. Yeah. Way to use Azrael. Um, and then I thought, well, it makes sense for the third volume to get into Batman beyond, um, in curse of the white knight. I, Azrael kills most of the villains. So there's kind of not a lot of Batman to do anyway. Uh, so I figured jumping ahead would be perfect. And then, um, at the end of this one, um, you know, I'd like to start expanding and planting seeds to get into some of the other, uh, big DC characters. Okay, so yeah, you just mentioned Azrael. Azrael, not yeah. a fan. And it's then your version, I liked your version <laughs> of Azrael. Like, and I'm not just saying that. There's another another member of uh, Batman on film, that Ryan Haas. He's a massive Azrael fan. And I told him, you need to get on Curse the White Knight because it's made me an Azrael <laughs> fan. So uh, props yeah. to you on that one, too. It's, it's funny. I, I loved his look in the 90s. Yes. I, I thought the fire, like, man, that was cool. The Casada covers. Uh, and then I read the best of Azrael and I'm like, no, he, I didn't feel like he ever had his great story. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to try to give him the best Azrael story ever and maybe win over people who didn't like Azrael because I, I wasn't an Azrael fan. So I thought, well, what if he was older and he was kind of like us, like Ram, he's basically first blood John Rambo. He's got PTSD. He's an ass kicker. He's definitely the villain, but there's enough context where where you can understand where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, like he has every right to be pissed off. It doesn't give him the right to kill anybody, but everything he does is for a reason. He's almost like a brutal warmonger from the middle ages. Who's been transplanted into Gotham in, in a sense, you know? And uh, I really wanted to set him up as a version of Batman that's willing to actually kill. And ironically, uh, and we get into this and in, in beyond uh, Azrael kind of maybe did more for Gotham than Batman did. Uh, as much as Bruce hates to admit it, murdering all those people actually might have been a good thing. And uh, there's a Azrael cult in this book. Instead of having oh. the Joker, we have the Azraels, and these are, you know, misled youths who are punk rockers, and they think that Azrael is the real savior of uh, Gotham, and Bruce Bruce is like a false savior or whatever. So they're mm -hmm. kind of kicking around in the background. I think I'm gonna do something with them by the end of the book. Maybe find a way to like have them help Batman or something. So everybody gets along. Um, but yeah, I, I'm glad you said that. Cause uh, I have people, people who love Azrael are kind of scary. They're very intense. Uh, and I know a lot of people who didn't like Azrael. So if I can convert you to <laughs> be an Azrael fan, sort of kind of, I'm, I'm flattered. <laughs> aesthetic, aesthetic always helps too. And yeah. I can see it in my head now. The, the nod to was it detective 500 of him in the suit falling back off the building? And it was oh, your yeah. version. That's yeah. what I can picture in my head. And I, I like that suit that you created for him as well. And then that oh. that's just like a, that's a, an iconic Azrael shot is that yeah. one falling back. And so your version yeah. was very cool and instantly recognizable yeah. to that too. Yeah. Mike, Mike mainly was the artist on that. Uh, and that was when you had okay. like the big the pouches and the, the claws and the gloves that don't make sense. And yeah. <laughs> as I was redesigning that costume, I'm like, man, this thing is wild. Like, how does this even make any sense? So I tried to ground it a little bit. I think the hard part was, so that's the Asbat suit. But when he's actually dressed as Azrael, these capes shoot off his shoulders, like these tassels, and they kind of go up and down, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, it works when Casada did it because he did it very designy, but I didn't feel like my art could get away with that. So I was trying to think of how these tassels would like be, I don't know, I probably put way too much thought into it. And even when I look back at the art, there's some panels where I feel like I still didn't quite get it right. But generally, I'm I'm pretty happy with it. Okay, well, I think it's all making sense here. And go with me as I ask this. So are are you a, a car guy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so are you really interested in how things work together under the end or under the hood? Yeah. I feel like that does go hand in hand as you're, you just said of like, right. I'm putting too much into it. Well, it's also yeah. thinking, how does everything work and connect together to make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to go along with me there, go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. Yeah. That, that's, definitely I was going to say, so if that's all, all there, well, then let's keep talking about you. So you're a, a car guy that maybe your biggest response to 
I mean, the first book is the Batmobiles. Yeah. And I just feel uh, like you like to, do you feel like you have to include some of that stuff just for your own, like geek out moments? <laughs> At this point, if I don't do a car thing, then people will revolt on me. Uh, sure. <laughs> but I, I genuinely do love driving. Uh, I love cars. Uh, redesigning Batmobiles was cool. Uh, getting the 89 to be part of the plot. Again, normally the 89 Batmobile is just in the background of the Batcave. Yeah. But I wanted them to be used um, by different characters. So the metaphor is that this is all the versions and eras of Batman coming together to overcome the Joker or whatever. Like he's accepting mm -hmm. his past. By accepting his past, he's accepting the old Batmobiles. And, you know, you can kind of see how poetically that that might make sense. Um but yeah, at this point, I mean, I'm kind of known as the car guy in comics. And it's weird because I know a lot of artists that draw cars pretty well. But for some reason, I mine stand out to people. Um, I don't trace or, you know, use a, I'm not a digital artist or anything like that. I don't just stick uh, models and draw around it like some mm -hmm. artists do. But something about the way I'm shooting them and framing them just seems to strike. Even people who aren't car people seem to be able to get into the cars a little bit, you know. You think it might be because while we have seen, and you know, I can instantly see Batcave images and Jim Lee's image of having the Batmobiles in the Batmobiles in the Batcave, but you put them all next to each other in action. Maybe that's oh, why yeah. you stand out as as the car yeah. guy because you have yeah. the guts to put all of them together <laughs> side by side in action. <laughs> Man, the, I was really excited for Cursed when Bruce is driving the 89. The 89 is kind of my favorite, so I always find okay. a reason to stick it in there. Sure. And in Curse, I have a surprise bee that the, the hood flips over and it turns into a, a bat boat. And uh, that was really hard to draw because I had to, I have an 89 model that I was eyeballing and then I had to flip it upside down to draw it from the, the backside. And I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out like where the exhaust pipe would go and the <laughs> things that no one cares about but me. And then uh, when you take the um, the ears of the Keaton Batmobile and flip it upside down, it kind of turns into two rudders in a way. So hmm. it's actually a pretty okay looking boat. Uh, if anybody pulls that out and go look at that panel, like I was really happy with how easily that car translated to being a boat, but it's one of those weird things that I have to pinch myself because I, I never thought I would have the ability and, um, you know, get, be getting paid to, to do stuff like this, you know? Yeah. All right. So 89 is, is your favorite. So then we're in the future now with beyond the white Knight. Um, I guess don't reveal if it's going to spoil something, but how did you figure out what you want to use vehicle wise for this since we're in the future here? And it was like what the bat wing and beyond. Yeah. So I made this model. Oh, cool. So you I made that. Kit yeah. I kit bashed cardboard and paper and pieces oh of other gosh. Batmobiles. And if you can even see like that's part of the 89 Batmobile right there with the scoop in the front. Oh my gosh. Nice. So I tried to keep it the same sort of shape and style as the Beyond Batmobile. It's basically like two commas stuck uh -huh. together in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah. But I also wanted to, to tweak it a bit because I, I don't love that design, if I'm honest. Like some of the ways they draw it in the cartoon is a little wonky. Mm -hmm. So I tried to, you know, I gave it a, a proper rear end with like um, Ferrari style rear lights and stuff like that. Little ears in the top. If this isn't a visual podcast and listeners are going to be pulling their hair out right now, <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> but, okay. uh, I'm, I made this model just as a, I wanted to do it. I enjoy this and it helps me wrap um, my head around the shapes better. I also made a small model of the um, GTO tank that the oh, nice Dick is driving around. This is a lot smaller. But uh, yeah, it's basically like any military nut would be able to tell you like, oh, that's part of a Panzer. That's part of a whatever. Yeah. That's a Sherman. <laughs> so yeah, fun stuff like this. Like I don't always have time to, to do this, but I don't know. Something I like to do. And of course I have here the, uh, the matchbox of the new The Batmobile. Yeah. Which I thought was oh, a, yeah. I really like this car. It looks like a Baja racer that you see that racing in dirt tracks or uh -huh. whatever. Um but yeah, I thought that the introduction to the Batmobile with the flames coming out of the hood and it's the best engine sound probably ever. I, I will I, say though, part of the car there's a lot of like Batman fighting traffic in that movie, mm -hmm. and I kind of wish they had done more like racing through empty streets and every now and then, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> but I really, but I really liked I it. 
Yeah, I mean, not to go on a tangent, but man, that first time viewing it, I was sitting there with my fiance and as it's revving up and I'm not like some kind of big car guy, but it's like, I'm a Batmobile guy and it's revving up and I just got giddy and I just got like, (laughs) oh my God, like what a great reveal. Um, For sure. So then if you can tell me, uh, what issue does this Batmobile debut then? Issue four. Okay. Very cool. Uh, Again, yeah, I have the pages here. I'll show them to you, but people can't see us or it's just a podcast people can watch. I, I guess I didn't, I didn't ask you for it. If you're cool with the, <laughs> us putting this video on YouTube. Um, yeah, please. Yeah. Put yeah. It on YouTube. Well then yeah. Um, Show away. Oh, where is it? So I haven't done the full reveal yet, but I have. Um, so anybody who hasn't read issue one, uh, this, there's going to be spoilers here. Okay. So you've been warned. Um, you can see Bruce is actually inside fixing it. It's in the uh, Bat Cave, which has been destroyed. These are like the ruins of uh, the Bat Cave, and you can see Joker right here, who's uh, uh, I people. So issue two, we'll find out uh, he's actually a hologram. He's a microchip inside Bruce's head, and Bruce cannot get rid of him. But he's there to help Bruce. But it turns into like the odd couple because Bruce is <laughs> awesome. really pissed off. <laughs> And like Joker's like joking around and like booping him on the nose. And but then he's able to help him and be like, hey, there's a guy coming over there. I'm going to download this from the city. Like it's almost like he's Jarvis in a way or Alfred. He's able to help Bruce. So by the end of the book, the two of them actually kind of start getting along. Um, and of course, um, Bruce is like torn whether or not he should tell Harley that he can see Joker and like Joker. Mm-hmm. He's, he's actually Jack neighbor. He's he's a good guy. Um yeah, I don't want to go too much into that, but like the biggest sure. fun of the book was actually writing Joker and Batman sort of teaming up as like, you know, lethal weapon wow. or something kind of yeah. not getting along, but starting to get along, you know, <laughs> that's a, uh, ah, that's such an, that's an awesome twist. So, I mean, each curse of the white Knight built on white Knight. I think Harley Quinn built on white Knight and curse of the white Knight, And I, this, it's just sounded like it's building on what's come before too. And that's, yeah. Man, like, how did you bring something new? I mean, I'm, I'll get back to beyond, but I mean, how did you find a way to come up with something new between that Batman and Joker relationship? Well, I got lucky because the first volume, because Joker is Jack Napier and he's kind of trying to be a good guy, it made it okay for people who think Joker's awesome to say Joker's awesome. Yeah. Otherwise, you're saying a serial killer is awesome. and You, can, mm-hmm. you can't do that. No. <laughs> For people who think that Joker is sexy, you can't say that about Joker because you're insane. However, Jack Napier, who is a reformed Joker, who uh, he's uh, got like split personality disorder and Joker is a virus that he can't get rid of. Now he's a victim. So uh, it kind of gives people permission to say the Joker's awesome, um, even though he's still kind of a bad guy every now and then. He's not, you know, he's it's, it's OK for you to like him. He's an antihero. Um, and jumping off of that, I thought, man, I know I killed him in curse, but what if he used Mad Hatter technology and when Bruce was unconscious, uh, injected this thing into his brain and he had a a program that was supposed to turn on if Bruce Wayne ever needed his help. And, uh, when Bruce escapes, uh, at the end of the first issue, suddenly he sees Jack and he has an age to day. So issue two, you know, of course, he's going to try to attack him and he goes right through and Bruce figures out, OK, you're a hologram. Where's the projection coming from? And Jack's like, you're going to love this man. I am literally inside your head. And Bruce is like, what? <laughs> what a great uh, joke, too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jack's like, oh, I'd love to give you the Freudian wedgie of like Batman <laughs> needs Joker. Maybe I'm a figment of your imagination here to drive you. But sorry to say I'm just a microchip. And, uh, you know, throughout the rest of the story, Bruce is making comments like I got to give myself a lobotomy or I should just smack my head against the wall to get rid of this guy. Uh, But, you know, inevitably he starts to realize Jack's actually very useful and he's maybe the only person that Bruce can trust. Um, And, you know, when Batman goes on an adventure alone, it's nice to have him be able to talk to somebody like, you know, Robin. In this Mm -hmm. case, uh, Joker points this out. He's like the best Robin ever. (laughs) Wow. So that's probably spoiling a lot, but... That's the heart of the book. Like, I think once issue two comes out, people will really see what I'm doing here. And hopefully like, they'll really like the, the team up of Jack and Bruce. Mm-hmm. Ah, wow. That's wild. 
but it's original <laughs> too. That's that's great. Yeah, so, I don't think anyone's done that. I, I know they've probably worked together at some point in the past, but never as friends, you know? No. I mean, I haven't read every single Batman and Joker comic book, but I've read quite a few yeah. and that seems completely yeah. heard it here first, you know? <laughs> yeah, but good. Well, it's funny because uh, Scott Snyder had um, in metal, he had um, Batman running around with Joker's head in a jar yeah, and the head was talking to him, right? But they weren't mm-hmm. working together or anything, were they? Uh, like, yes, a little bit like yeah. Joker. It felt like he had answers that he was prolonging and giving him, but they weren't like, Hey, go yeah. to this spot and you'll find this direct answer. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cause I didn't want to tread on what Scott had done. And I think in the end, he might've suggested maybe the head wasn't alive at all. Maybe it was mm-hmm. all in Bruce's head or something. So I thought about doing that in this, but I made it. Nope. It's, it's a microchip. It's, it's, <laughs> there's a physical reason why this is happening and good luck getting it out of there. <laughs> well another star of the book i feel again i've only read the first issue at this point is going to be terry mcginnis oh yeah so how did you approach including him when you realized you were going to incorporate batman beyond well I, I knew that people who love terry they like him being a troubled uh high schooler mm-hmm. so if he's breaking and entering uh, that's probably good they like that stuff uh, running with a rough crowd, dad passed away, he blames himself, single mom, bratty brother. Um, so I kept all that stuff intact, but I, I have him working with powers. And uh, he is, in the first few issues with him, it seems like he's sort of unaware of what how, how powers is manipulating him. But in issue four, we come to a scene where we realize, oh, wait, no, Terry's smarter than he's letting on. And he's playing powers because... You know, Terry's not the bad guy in the book. He's just confused. And with the loss of his dad and all that, he's got a lot of anger issues. Um, so what the book's going to turn into, which is basically what Batman Beyond is, is what if Batman trained an angry Spider-Man, <laughs> right? That's kind of yeah. what Batman Beyond basically is. So, uh, but, you know, he's not nerdy Peter Parker. He's actually cool with cool hair and a cool leather jacket and all that. So he's what Spider-Man wishes he, he would be. Yeah, once I had sort of the recipe for that, things just kind of wrote themselves. I uh, it's funny. I made the mistake of I always thought Terry was half Asian, mm-hmm. and I put it out there, and I realized there's a lot of people who like Batman Beyond who assume Terry is half Asian, and there's no reason you think that because his dad is clearly white, his mom is white, uh, McGinnis. I mean, but I think there's so much Japanese influence in the design of Neo Gotham. There's so much, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, kanji kaiju kanji kanji I think right? kaiji kaiji sorry I, yeah uh and uh it's just you know it, it takes a lot from blade runner and terry's look you know his hair and his just the way he mm-hmm. was animated people just thought he was maybe half asian and uh there's i'd say like 20 percent of the people i've run into thought that as well so for my book i said well let's make his mom asian so he's now actually half asian and i didn't do it for like you know sjw points or being a liberal i'm not like race swapping him i just thought it would be cool to give a lot of people who mistakenly thought he was half asian an actual half asian version but it doesn't matter the story at all you know it's not a thing it's just in the background if you're paying attention to it sure well you just said so with with kaiji so i feel like that's a little bit was there maybe some of that influence in your punk rock jesus tokyo ghost and it looks like here how do you incorporate futuristic but make it feel timeless because I, unfortunately, yeah, I do feel question. like the TV show tried yeah. to be like, this is the future. And I feel like it is a little dated now. Yeah, it was but, dated when it came out, man. Okay. The soundtrack, dude, the, the opening heavy song, metal or electric yeah. guitars. Like, like, I want to be in that <laughs> meeting in like 1997. They're like, you know, what's going to be really cool in 30 years. Yeah. Electric, electric guitar solos. I could have <sighs> been like, no, dude, nope. that's <laughs> off the now. Do not do that. Yeah. <laughs> Like the worst character in that show is the music. And it's nonstop. There's always some like wailing guitar yes. in the background. And it's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a great show. But I, I hate the music in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. So so with with that. I mean, I guess. So how do you draw you, a futuristic you, Gotham that's not time? That's sort of timeless. Is what you're yeah, because right? White, White Knight, you made it pretty timeless too and i think a lot of people noticed of like oh this this just feels like batman the animated series so it seems like right. your your fandom of that show bled through the pages but if it did yeah. feel very timeless and so yeah how do you do that for this futuristic book yeah i don't know i mean 
my style is naturally a little raw and a little 1970s. Mm -hmm. Um, like I used to use Zipatone a lot. I don't use it on this book at all, but there's just something about the way I see things and the way I draw. It's like mixing Toth and some EC Comics guys, and you know mm -hmm. a lot of inks and EC I, so Comics. Even if well I, done. EC Comics. Hey, well thanks. done. Yeah. Like even if I tried to draw an accurate beyond Neo Gotham, like in the show, I don't think I could do it. I just think inherently because my stuff reads as old school and gritty. No matter what I draw is gonna have that vibe to it. I just I can't escape it. You know, I use a lot of fingerprints in my rendering. So there's this all this dust and scratches going on. And um, yeah, it is what it is. I mean, I guess it's a blessing because it's working out. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I try to draw clean, you know, futuristic buildings sometimes, and it's still just they look a little bit gritty, you know. <laughs> I guess so. Are you I mean everybody's their own harshest critic? Are you your harshest critic then? I'd say so. Yeah. You think so? Oh, yeah. There's some, there's some, there's some assholes online though that are pretty harsh. As oh, well. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody get on social uh, media, right? They're, you'll yeah, find right. your enemies. Um, it's funny, you know, uh, sort of, the, if you were asking me, honestly, the harshest critics I've run into are other professionals who okay. are probably wanting to do their own universe, who would like to write and draw their own stuff. And, you know, artists aren't supposed to write. So to, to be doing both double duty and to be selling so well probably annoys a lot of people. They don't say that to my face, but I, I can tell sure. when I go to the bar, whatever, and I'll see you know, friends of mine will let me know. So the harshest criticism I get is from my peers. Uh, readers generally seem to give me a pass. Like I get 99% positivity. Uh, even when I was on Twitter, I just, I didn't antagonize people. I just had to I don't know. You know, you, you reap what yeah. you sow. So I, I tried to be cool. I'd still get trolls every now and then, but generally I have no complaints. Good. That's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so let's see, you said you're working on issue four now. So you're about what, do you generally work three issues ahead? So yeah, with white Knight, I try to get four or five issues in the can before we release the first issue. Cause I don't want to mm -hmm. be late. Yeah. Um, with this one, um, I'm, slowing down a bit to take more time in the art so i try i have about 10 percent more time on the art than i normally do in, in this because i want it to look better that slowdown meant what am i going to do because i'm going to start falling behind so we came up with a two issue uh mini of red hood that's going to start coming out so my issues will be one two three four and then we'll pause for two months while red hood comes out cool and that'll be uh, written by me my friend clay mccormick who i do a podcast with uh, he's also been helping me with Batman since day one, but never gotten credit for it. So this was like a favor for him, finally, you know. And the art is going to be by Simone DeMeo, who did cool. uh, We Only Find Them When They're Dead. He's absolutely destroying on the art. So awesome. it's, it's very different than mine, but I think it fits Jason Todd and Neo Gotham very well. So you have two issues of that in, in between, and then my issues, five, six, seven, eight, will come out after that. So you're basically going to have this book happening from now till December. Okay couple questions concerning that so this feels right. like you're almost dropping double... a lot on you i know <laughs> yeah that's great so it's almost like you're you're i i feel like the the von freeze story during curse the white knight was it as big of a hit as i feel it was no it, it was like a lot and of people loved that it was shocking story. because that was a six dollar book and back then comics weren't for mm -hmm. five dollars they were like three or i don't know maybe four so we did uh it was double issue so it was 48 pages uh klaus jansen is a f real friend of mine and i think he's obviously talented he did dark yeah. knight returns you know and um i wish more people these days gave him credit so i'm like glad because he's kind of got an old school style as well and i was worried mm -hmm. like, what if people turn on him because he doesn't draw like me that did not happen um and writing the script was tricky because i had like a flashback and a flashback within a flashback in a way, like a two bookends with another bookend. So it was a really tricky way to talk about all that stuff. And you're dealing with Nazis and Jews dying and all that crazy stuff. And people can start reading politically into it. You know, Donald Trump was, um, you know, making a lot of noise back then. So there's a lot of people were trying to, you know, see like everyone was hating on Trump and comics. So they're reading mine, like, you know, and I had people on both sides claiming me as being on their side. So I'm like, yeah. 
you know, if I'm, if I'm, if, if, if I'm writing vague enough, then I'm doing my job. Cause I don't want to be, I don't like anyone telling me what to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, you know, it's funny too, because Klaus is a uh, German and he has in his own words, a lot of German guilt over a lot of that stuff. Still he's in his uh, mid to late sixties now. And he never got to draw a, um, a Nazi Indiana Jonesy, you know, anything like that. So he was really excited to finally do this. And uh, yeah, he really brought it on the art. And I was really mm-hmm. glad that people uh, showed up for that. I think the sales on that were still like 55,000, but for a, a $6 book that I wasn't drawing is I was really impressed that, that yeah. it did so well. And that's kind of what made me, uh, what, what allowed me to push um, the Harley book my wife did and yeah. this Red Hood book. Cool. So that's what I was going to ask. Cause I know that on the other day on Instagram, you posted a, a, a picture of it. Um, and I, I thought that it was going to be like another Harley Quinn uh, series. So with this kind of being a interlude, a half halftime show, yeah. maybe, you know, yeah. sort of deal. Um, <laughs> that works. So you have an eight issues of Beyond the White Knight. When did you figure out that eight issues seems to be the sweet spot? Because this is the third now book that's eight issues. No, fourth, yeah, I guess. I don't... Count Harley. It was Harley eight or six? Harley was six. Yeah, I was six. Okay. So your books have all been eight. Seems like a sweet yeah. spot. Yeah, I don't know why, honestly. Um, if you do eight, if you wanted to break it into, you know, two acts, you could mm-hmm. make a graphic novel with four issues and then a second graphic novel, the four issues and charge more for each of them. Uh, I, so I thought I might have said eight because DC might want to break this up into two chunks and then make more money. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, that, that didn't happen for, for better or worse. Actually, I'm glad that it's all collected because I hate when they do that. It feels kind of gimmicky, gimmicky, and like they're gouging people. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we did the wake, Scott and I, and it was eight issues, and um, they collected all uh, four into a set. Then they never collected issues five through eight, so it was like buy issues one through four or buy issues one through eight. And it just didn't make any sense to me. So I might have pitched it as eight just because I was used to the eight issues as far as working with Scott on the wake and everything. But yeah, I don't really have a good answer for that. I just, okay. eight was the number we sure. picked. <laughs> I think that is, I mean, that's good because sometimes 12 issues can seem too long. Sometimes six issues can be too, too short. So I, again, not just saying this, but like, I think eight yeah. issues is a good, and it's not that common yeah. either. So I think right. that's, that's a good balancing act, especially yeah. when, I mean, I feel like you put, you put a lot of layers in your storytelling too. There's a, my stuff's complicated. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a lot of monologuing in it in volume one political. I mean, I don't think I would write that way right now. I mean, you had a political thriller, so you're going to have politicians making speeches. Sure. There's no way to get around all those word balloons. But I, I sort of was asking a lot from readers when I'm hitting with walls of text on pages. Like with this one, I try to keep it less than two or three word balloons per panel and try to have silent pages every now to give people a break. Cause I know not everybody's into that stuff. Um, but yeah, like I, I tend to write very thick and I I'll bet that it probably takes people twice as long to read my book than it does most comics. And some people like that and some people don't. Um, if you gave me 12 issues, I think I would, I wouldn't do as well because I would start adding new shit and then it would fall apart, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like as it was with volume one, I wanted to have the Von Fries stuff included in it. Like I was going to get into some of that stuff, but there was just no space for it. So they said, well, let's do a mini series after and you can get, have someone else draw it. And that, you know, um, so yeah, you don't want to give me 12 because I'll just jam it up. I think maybe <laughs> eight's the sweet spot. You so you just said that you that sometimes you do a lot of text, but I think I mean ch- maybe check every single review I've done on on your books. But I've always said do you have really good pacing. It does kind of feel Thanks. it's like it's forward. We hit the ground running it and we just go. And I know yeah. with Curse you did some backstory, but it wasn't. It definitely wasn't like too much. It was a, definitely a right. good balance. I think to accomplish what you were trying yeah. to. I'm not going to speak for you, but I think it definitely did. But I do think that your pacing is always, it's on. So maybe you feel like you've got too much wording in there, but I think it, it moves. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I, I guess, yeah, I, um, I, I feel like I'm pr- pretty decent with natural sounding dialogue. Um, my, where I'm bad as a writer is I, I tend to over explain things mm-hmm. and my, my editor will be like, 
people get it. You don't need to explain it a, th- <laughs> a second or a third time. It's fine. So I'm always fighting with myself. Like, is this clear? Should I explain it in a different way? You know, and then mm-hmm. it gets too wordy, but I'm working on, on not being like that. Um, for uh, curse of the white knight, I felt like the pacing was better. I think the, for, the volume one I'm really proud of, but I think it is t- 10% too overloaded. If hmm. I had to be honest, I, I love the freeze stuff. Um, and the bit of history that we do get in there, but it gets to be a little heavy at that point. Um, with Curse Volume Two, I felt the pacing was a lot better because I I knew more about myself as a writer at that point. Yeah. Um, and the risk there was like not everybody is into historical thrillers. Like I had like swashbuckling and pirates, and uh, I think a lot of people weren't as much into that as they were as Volume One, which is which is fine. Um, for this one, I think it's more back to what people want and what they're expecting. And I tried to fix the pacing to make the pacing even better where I have tried to have a handful of action scenes in every issue cut down on monologuing, of course, a couple silent pages to give people a breather. Like I think when people flip through a comic, they're thinking like there's like a plus sign or a minus sign over their head. Like I'm into this page or this page is a slog. Mm-hmm. And I think if you give them two negative sign pages in a row, they start to fade. <laughs> I think you have to be aware, like inevitably you have to have a, a page. We have to explain stuff and it's going to be kind of a drag, but if you can do it in an interesting way or follow that page up with a great action page, I think you've got them back again. It's kind of like a song where you have like a slow part and a fast part, this mm-hmm. beat guitar solo, whatever. I try to be aware of like, how is the reading experience? And am I putting too many negative pages together? You know, I, I really want to make sure I don't do that. <laughs> so do you think that you figured that out about yourself by illustrating for a lot of other authors or as a fan or maybe as a, a blend of both? Yeah, I mean, I work with writers who give me stuff that I didn't like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's all oh, I just go through that. It's OK. I'm sure I've written stuff for I'm sure I wrote Klaus pages. He didn't like <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um and I think uh, after so many years, I, I was like, you know what? I don't, I feel like I could write this stuff myself. I'm not saying I'm Ernest Hemingway, but like comics is like wrestling matches. It's like WWF sure. or whatever. I mean, so you just mm-hmm. set this up, set the premise, have a little bad dialogue. It's okay. People are very forgiving in comics. They're not expecting Shakespeare. Um, I take it very seriously. Like, I'm not trying to downplay it or disrespect it. Um, but I, I think that... Um, the stakes are not as high in some ways. And there's a lot of latitude and people are rooting for you. You know, like people are wanting comics to be as good as they, they are. Like, even when you know, something is a, a C minus, you kind of really are telling people that it's a B minus because you want to believe that this hobby of ours is still got legs, you know? Yeah. Um, so when I figured that out, I started relaxing and not being so uptight about my writing, but I also wanted to stick to like three act structure. And mm-hmm. so that's how they write screenplays, movies and get to the point. And, I don't do voiceovers at all, or um, sorry, I don't do inner monologues. A lot of writers will have just, you know, caption boxes of what Bruce is thinking all the time. And in movies, you generally don't do that unless you have a really good reason, like Forrest Gump or something, right? Yeah. Um, or like, you know, what's another one? Road to Perdition. No, Road to Perdition. No, it didn't really have it. Shawshank Redemption had one. Um, but I found that with comics, it's really distracting to have to know what Bruce is thinking all the time. Why not put a character there for him to actually say, talk to. And I took it even further. I don't even like it when you have um, ex- scene descriptions, like later that day or uh, 6 PM, the other side of town. I feel like it's better to tell people what time it is by showing a newspaper or a clock in the background, or, you know, yeah. there's gotta be, I just don't think spoon feeding it to people is healthy. Uh, and I think readers are smarter than that. And I think uh, the reason that there's a lot of inner monologues in comics is because writers want to feel like their fingerprint is there and they insist on doing this stuff. That way you can appreciate their masterful wordsmith prose, you know, <laughs> and it sounds like I'm taking the piss out of writers. And I, I guess I am a little bit right now. <laughs> you are a writer. So there you go. Writers, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm allowed. Yeah. To. But as the artist, like, I know my fingerprints are literally on the page. People mm-hmm. know that I'm I'm working hard. I don't need to have inner monologues from Bruce. I can just make it dialogue driven. And I think it makes for a much cleaner read. Um, 
yeah, and I don't know why comics just assume everything has to have inner monologues, but I just I just don't think it's something that we should just go to all the time, you know, but maybe I'll change my mind one day, you know, you never know. I think that goes into how I just said, I feel like your pacing is always just moving too. It's because sometimes not saying that I don't like it in some stories, but sometimes you do turn a page and you see this much inner dialogue then this much, yeah. then this much. And it is a little bit yeah. of like a, Oh, this is going to be a lot of work on this page. So I think yeah, it, it's your yeah. style to your own unique style. And I think that, I mean, yeah. check the receipts, you know, it's working, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're right though. If you get a long wall of Bruce thinking to himself, it's the story stops and he's feeding you information in a new way. And I suppose that could work, but what if he was doing something or explaining this information to someone and moving the plot forward? Yeah. You wouldn't have to have all these boxes everywhere. Like, I don't know if stalling the plot is worth it just so the writer can give off, can, you know, dive into his masturbatory bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I got a couple more questions and I'll, I'll let you go. Um, you've done, I think it's been known for your white knight books that there have been variant covers. So are you going to have uh, what do you, is it at least one variant cover for each issue? Uh, the sweet spot is the main cover and then one variant. Cool. Uh, and what I've been doing is these character variants. So mm-hmm. I changed the logo. The, so for issue one, it's Wayne, uh, you know, just Bruce Wayne or whatever. For issue two, I think it's um, Terry McGinnis. Uh, and they look very different from the other. And I just sort of want to have the normal cover and then one for the super fan. Uh, I don't believe in doing too many variants. I think yeah. it's unfair to shops and it's short-term thinking. Uh, they did convince me to do one for the Red Hood book by Olivier Coipel. And he did a killer job as always. Nice. I think that's going to be a one to 25 variant. Um, we might end up doing more variants because the marketing rollout was a little mishandled and we our numbers are lower than what they should be. So we need to figure out a way to play a game to get the numbers back up. So sure. you might see me do a few more variants. I'm not into this idea at all, but my team is suggesting it. So we're going to give it a try. <laughs> gotcha. Is that something you've always wanted to do is handle the variants yourself? Uh, yeah. I uh, Drawing yeah, them, I not like the, the it, yeah. plan of the rollout, <laughs> but like doing them. You want to do the variants because yeah. you have ideas. Well, with um, Tokyo Ghost, we tried this, Rick and I, we did the normal cover and then we did one variant and we found that that was the sweet spot. If you do more mm-hmm. than two, it's, it starts to, you eat into your own uh, sales. We did one, at, uh, Mark Millar and I did one with Chrononauts that had like six variants for issue one. And even though it's like, you can brag about your high sales, that's an artificial number. You're, you're, you don't have high sales. You have the same amount of readers buying multiple copies. That spike is going to go down it's sort of pointless in doing it. And honestly, the money we paid all these other variant, uh, all these other artists to do it, we didn't make that money back. So it just ended up just being a gimmick that annoys comic book shops. Sure. However, if you just do two covers for me, I find that's, that's the sweet spot. Yeah. I mean, cause it does, I mean, it does give enough as a comic book fan going, it's like, I can swing getting the variant too. That's pretty cool. But you see five variants like, well, I don't want to get any yeah. because a completest nature <laughs> yeah. in me, you know, sort of yeah. deal. Yeah. So obviously we don't want to spoil beyond the white knight, but do you, is this the finale to your white knight story or do you see something beyond this in some way, not saying yeah. next in the timeline, not a prequel, whatever, but is this a finality for you? My plan is to lay two big uh, seeds at the end of this which will lend themselves to two other spinoffs. Um, I can't tell you what, cause it will spoil sure. the ending, but uh, I definitely have an idea for volume four and possibly volume five. Nice. I don't know though. I love DC, but things are weird at this company right now and the marketing and it, it's just, I it's killing the fun for me. Okay. So I hope that I return after this and I hope I can do volume four, but if things at DC aren't fixed, then I might just take a break for a while and just do my own stuff on the side. Maybe, you know, come out of retirement in five or 10 years and do volume four or whatever, but I'd like to, but it's kind of, I guess it is up to me, but I don't want to seem too down on, on DC, but I'm just not happy with some of the changes happening in the office and uh, it's kind of killing the fun. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So yeah I yeah. hope I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's wait and see. 
Um, yeah, let's let's see. get through Beyond the White Knight, which, yeah. <laughs> so, like I told you, read issue one. Uh, I loved it. Thought it's a great continuation. I'm really excited to read uh, the rest of it. So I hope you feel Thanks, pretty pretty proud of it because I'm yeah, off, off to a good start so far. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I think issue two will be even more of a buzz, especially with the ending on issue two. There's a a big reveal about uh, Bruce and a, a female character. Okay. All right. Tease that. All right. Well, I'll <laughs> let you know as soon as I read it. So, uh, thank you again for doing. Oh wait, this. let me this ask you. Be... Let me let me okay, ask sure. you a few questions now. All uh, right. How many how many viewers, independent users, do you have on this channel? That's that is a Bill Ramey question. I'm not exactly <laughs> not exactly sure uh, the numbers on this end. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry. But I, that's I bet not you a have a pretty answer. loyal. No, it's okay. You. I bet you have a loyal following of. Uh, listeners who pop in and chime in and comment and stuff from time to time they do on batman and film yeah they do for nice. sure yeah 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 what okay. uh do you and the, there's two other guys that are on this channel there's a there's a whole team bill is the 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 head he's the man who yeah. started it all he's the one that's right gotten to talk with christopher nolan and all all the good stuff and then oh, yeah nice. there's a whole team of contributors of garrett's me pete ryan haas yeah. uh eric right. yeah Who's the most passionate about Batman? I mean, I probably got to say Bill or else he'll kick me <laughs> off the team, right? So, <laughs> right. Who, uh, we are, who we're all pretty level, but right. Bill's probably he's got he's got some years on us too. So, I mean, it's True, yeah. it's Bill, yeah. What uh do you all agree on the best movie and the best uh, series or do you have wildly different opinions? You still love it, I know. We're we're all usually on the on the same like roughly in the same ballpark for sure. I mean, right. we all hung out for the first time, got to hang out in person the weekend the Batman came out. We were all down in Texas together, and it was a hell of oh, a cool. weekend that we all clashed or not clashed, like got together and hung out. <laughs> there was no clashing; everything was great. And we're I mean, we're all on the same wavelength. It's a great group uh, yeah. of Bat fans. So, but we're all pretty yeah. much in the. I mean, we all love the Nolan era '89. We all love this new movie. So yeah, yeah. Do you have any defenders of uh, Schumacher in there? Oh yeah, Bill defend Batman forever, really until he takes his last breath because he <laughs> loves to tell everybody that that was a hit in 1995. Um, I was nine years he's, old. He's, yeah, I was I was the perfect age for what that movie was trying to do. That was really? the best Christmas of my life because yeah. it was nothing but Batman and like you know toys and clothes and yeah. everything was Batman. It was yeah. what a time to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I don't think. When that came out, I remember seeing it and I thought I liked it because why would they give us a bad Batman movie? Yeah. And it wasn't until the second one came out where everyone turned and was like, maybe the third one wasn't as good, actually. <laughs> like, this is yeah. kind of dumb, right? <laughs> like, the first one snuck through without people getting too uh, judgy on it. I mean, it had all those music videos and MTV and all yeah. that, you know, all that shit. So maybe we were distracted by that. But then when the fourth one came around, we were like, okay, wait a minute. I think we were fucked in the third one too. (laughs) Like in hindsight, we did some revisionist history on that. We're like, fat nipples. What the hell was that? Yeah. So are you not, are you not a fan of forever, even now, given it some time? Because once really quick. So I was still, I mean, I was still like 11 when Batman and Robin came out. And so to me, it was, it was just Batman, but then gave me just like a year or two. And then I realized like, well, this isn't good. And then it made me <laughs> not like that stuff because I thought, what if I never see another Batman movie? And then the Nolan movies yeah. came out, which actually to me helped the Schumacher movies because I was like, this isn't the end. I can still enjoy some parts, make fun of the others. Right. It's not a big deal because yeah. I still have yeah, new, yeah. better Batman. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if you want to be as generous as possible, you could say that Schumacher did a great uh, Adam West version. Like he basically took the 66 and said it in the 90s like it's yeah. supposed to be campy and silly and over the top like he made the movie that he wanted mm-hmm. but that's not my batman you no. Know? <laughs> no. i mean if it makes you feel better i never got that from any of your batman work that it was okay. adam west batman so <laughs> mission accomplished <laughs> yeah it's funny um in cur- uh in volume one i have this big ice cannon in the middle of the city mm-hmm. and uh People were like, "Oh, Sean's uh, even putting in, uh, uh, yeah, Batman, Batman Forever Easter eggs." And I got to tell you, I totally fucking forgot that uh, there was an ice can <laughs> in that movie. 
I might have like stolen it without realizing it. Uh, I know that their ice cannons have been in the comics for a few times, so that's not anything new. But when I did rewatch Batman Forever and this ice gun, even it like freezes Gotham, I'm like, oh my god, I swiped this. I didn't even know it. Like, oh, I tried so hard not to do that, and like here it is, in, well, in full color. He didn't do any corny one-liners though, because then he yeah. could have said that. Okay, now you are. Yeah. Now it's a little <laughs> obvious, but the ice can, I mean, it's Mr. Freeze. It's yeah, it happens. I mean, it happens. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. What else am I going to ask you? Do you guys go to uh, any shows and do live recordings or anything like that? I mean, not yet. I mean, we've, we'd be ambitious, but of course the past, I mean, we're now in year three of the stuff yeah. starting to get back to normal. So, I mean, hopefully, hopefully right. in the future, I'd love to, right. I'm, I'm three hours from Chicago. I lived in Chicago for five years. Um, right. That'd be great. Something to do like that. Right. So one last question for you. Sure. Uh, if I had a some kind of Batman celebrity s- standing behind you and you're going to turn around and be shocked, which celebrity would blow your mind the most? Like you're going to lose your shit. And then you can. And we can't bring Adam West back to life because that would no, be okay. surprising for a lot of reasons. Whoever's still uh, living. See- yeah, who would someone it? who would make you lose your shit the most. Oh my god, that's a that's a great question. It, it could would be an artist, could be a director, an actor, it could be Kevin uh, Kevin Sorbo, Kevin Conroy. <laughs> it would, oh my god, that's tough. I almost, oh, I would almost say Christopher Nolan because I'd have a lot of questions, but maybe it would be Michael Keaton. Yeah, that was my first Batman. You know. Yeah, and he's Keaton still so energetic. And he's yeah. like, I watch him when he does interviews and talk shows and stuff. And he just looks like such a great conversationalist that I think I'd be like, I wouldn't be able to say anything, but that's okay. Cause he'd be able to talk. So I think that'd be the one that would blow my mind. Right. Yeah. That's but good. any of them would Robert Pattinson's behind me. Yeah. I'd lose my shit. <laughs> <laughs> Colin Farrell is penguin behind me. Maybe I'd lose my shit even more. I don't know. <laughs> I have. Oh, yeah. Who would oh, cool. be yours? Yeah, I'm always curious where people take that question. Uh, maybe. Kevin Conroy. That would be the most personal one. Like, I wouldn't lose my shit with Kevin Conroy, but I'd want to take him out to dinner and just talk. Oh, to yeah. Him, you know, like yeah. get to know him. My um, my friend and art dealer for my birthday, uh, what's that website where you can pay celebrities to talk to you? Cameo. Cameo, thank right, you. Cameo. Uh so yeah, so he he bought a cameo mm-hmm. from Kevin um Conroy and uh had him read from White Knight. Um, he read uh, some of the lines, but Batman's reading this like letter that Alfred read him. It's sort of like Alfred's goodbye letter, and it's you know three or four big word balloons. And Conroy read it in his fucking Batman voice. And awesome. he, at the end, he was even like, "And scene," like he took it <laughs> seriously. You know, like he was almost like he thought we were uh, it was being recorded for a show. I mean, he put wow. everything into it. It was amazing. And I'm like, "Oh man, this is crazy!" Like if you rewind to 1993. Or a thirteen-year-old Sean, it would, I mean, yeah, that would have been amazing. So I think take, seeing him, like I have the most to say to him, but I think Keaton would blow my mind as well. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I've met Conroy. I mean, yeah. too many. Any of the Batman, I'd be, I'd yeah. probably lose it, except for maybe George. I don't know that I get crazy about George. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think George would. Be, he's like, no. why am I here? Really, <laughs> Batman? <laughs> Didn't we all agree that that was a mistake? Yeah, uh, I actually worked with uh, Chris Nolan. That I flew out to LA and worked on um, Interstellar on a, a comic that uh, was published by Wired Magazine. Really? And I had to go to his working office house and spend a few hours chatting with him wow. about this script. Um, so I'm in, in the room with him, his assistant, and the guy from Wired Magazine. And he has like the thimble from um, uh, that movie he did. Inception? That I'm on right now. Thank you. Yeah. He had um, the model he made of the bat pod. And he makes it like not as good as i do he just clumps together a bunch of clay <laughs> it's like clay yeah. right yeah yeah it's pretty gross looking but wow. yeah, it works for him uh so i did get to hang out with him and i i held my i didn't geek out i held it all inside At the very end i did ask for a, a selfie with him and he obliged me he's a very serious guy very deliberate i don't know if i'd want to get drinks with him but uh, oh, yeah. i respect i respect to the hell out of him for sure <laughs> It, it was it one of those like you're you're thinking I need to have an equal level of ask a little Batman, but then ask like we're not going to talk about Batman. We're going to talk about something else, and then squeeze in a little more Batman. Tried. I was like, 
I tried to say, uh, I'm not a digital artist. I like to do things analog, just like you, Chris yeah. Nolan, <laughs> you know, it all, you get it all in the can. Like I'm definitely yeah. old school. Like I tried to sell it like that. Um, he wrote a script, like hand wrote uh, notes on two pieces of paper and said, just draw this and make this work in panels. So because I could write, I was able to like take his chicken scratches, break it into eight pages or whatever, figure out the good page device. Like I did a lot of heavy lifting as a writer on that. Um, but it's okay. He's a busy guy and I'm just happy to be there, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a book. There was a wired magazine in UK, uh, for the interstellar release. It's basically a prequel story of Matt Damon's character on this ice planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's sort of this, uh, deleted scene, if you will, from, from that movie. So if anyone can get their hands on that, it's only in, in London, I think if you can find it, but I was going to say, how can we find this? But good luck, man. Good luck. Go I to London, not, I guess. <laughs> I have I have not seen I think I've seen one at a show. People stand in line to get uh signatures from, yeah. from idiot. So I see a lot of my old stuff. I've never seen someone bring that to me. And that, that would be pretty amazing. Would you try and buy it off of them and be like, Can I have this actually? I'll <laughs> <laughs> no. I want this. <laughs> yeah, no, man, I should definitely. Yeah, uh, that'd be great. Uh yeah, uh, I need to, I want to respect your time. I could keep asking yeah, thank you questions, but I will let you go no, no. for sure. Thank do, you so much do it for again doing sometime, this. Man. Thank yeah, you. That'd be, doing that'd be favor, great, man. I appreciate this. Yeah. Do you want to plug anything at all for somebody who may not know where to find Sean Murphy? So yeah, Beyond the White Knight is coming out the next uh, eight months. Simone DeMeo and Clay McCormick are writing the Red Hood two issue. Uh, what did you call it? Miniseries uh, intermission. Spin-off? Intermission. Spin-off, there we go. Sure. The intermission. Intermission. Yeah. I like intermission. That uh, sounds good. <laughs> after that, I'm going to be working on Zorro. I bought the rights to Zorro to do my own book. Uh, awesome. So I'm going to do a Kickstarter with that. Uh, Disney and well, the Zorro people are planning a big Zorro push in the next few years. Uh, I thought I was the only one that gave a shit about Zorro anymore, but apparently I'm wrong. So that's exciting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll be rolling out that Kickstarter. I don't know, maybe a year from now. So I don't even know why I'm plugging it. But yeah, that's my it's plan. It's on the radar. That's that's very cool. And I'm sure you'll post that on your Instagram and everything. Oh, 100%. Okay. Yeah. And where can, what are you on Instagram for anybody? Uh, I think it's just Sean Gordon Murphy. Sean Gordon Murphy. Okay. I okay. believe so. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank Thanks, you very Ryan. much for taking the time. This has been this has been great. Yeah. Uh, anybody listening, if you're just listening, track down the video so you can see the cool stuff that Sean was showing off. Uh, <laughs> And go to batmanonfilm.com. Uh, you can find my reviews on there today. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff on the Batman. It's the source to go to for, for Batman. So then now we will have announcer Rachel take us out. Thanks again, Sean. You have been listening to the official podcast of the one and only Batman on Film website. On Twitter, follow BOF at Batman on Film. And the Batman Podcast Network at Batpod Network. For Jet and everyone at Batman on Film, I'm announcer Rachel. Thanks for listening to the authoritative, definitive, the original Batman on Film.